Our next reading is taken from the Hebrew scripture lessons. It's uh, one of our lectionary readings for today. So hear God's word as it comes to us from the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. Listen to God's word. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other God beside me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses God's name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. When the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you desire to reveal yourself to us in so many ways. As we reflect upon your word to us, help us to draw near to you so that we might recognize you not only in the words of this text, but in the power of the living God who put on flesh and dwelt among us when you came to us in Christ. And so open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to your word to us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Like many young adults, I took on a range of odd jobs to supplement my my nine to five work during the weekdays. I was a babysitter as I had been since I was 12. I was an aerobic kickboxing instructor, which I know will probably come as a surprise to many of you. And for a few years after college, I spent most of my Saturdays working as um, an assistant to a wedding photographer. Now really, I was a friend who was happy to carry bags, load film, take candid images, and people watch with one of my closest friends whose photography business was taking off. And in exchange for this work, she bought me a camera. It's a camera I still have today, but it is nothing like the iPhone that I carry in my pocket every day that I am accustomed to pulling out at a moment's notice to catch a picture of my son on the playground slide and worry about editing later. This was a camera into which you put film that you had to use your thumb to advance the film so that it caught on those little hooks. And then you had to rewind that film and take it 
someplace else to be processed so that you could even look at the tiniest image you may have captured on this film. Now, this camera also utilized that old school methodology where I had to decide in any instant how to manipulate the settings on the camera so that I could let the right amount of light in. I didn't push on a sensor and let the camera do the work. I had to figure it all out, thinking about the film that was in the camera, the ambient light, and the subject of the image I was trying to capture. Now, what's more, every time I took an image, a picture at one of these weddings, I had to stop and think and make a decision. Was this image I was going to try to get worth the cost of the film, right? There was not a cloud that allowed you to store an unlimited amount of photos. Any picture I took had to be printed. Was this frame of a dancing flower girl with chocolate icing on her face an image that we had already taken multiple times? Or was there something novel we were going to capture in this shot? And before focusing the lens, I had to make all of those adjustments to decide how much light I needed to let in. I was thinking of this practice as I was thinking of our biblical text for this morning, for this is precisely what we do when we look at any biblical text, isn't it? For the word of God is vast, contextual, and it holds up a broad mirror to us, reminding us that with everything we learn about God or ourselves, there is still so much more to learn. And so we strive to let the light in in manageable doses so that we can focus on God's word to us right here and right now so that we might carry that word with us into our week. And then the lectionary goes and does something like give us this text of the Ten Commandments as our Hebrew scripture passage for the day. Now, it is by far one of the most famous, well-known passages in all of Scripture. Whether we have heard it through Sunday school since our childhood days, or whether we simply learned about it by watching one of a masterpiece on film, the Ten Commandments are situated in Scripture and in our culture in a way that bears truth to a much larger story. Whether one is Jewish or Christian or holds a different belief system altogether, the Ten Commandments are known. They are known as a calibrator of one's moral compass. They are known as a subject of a major motion picture. They are known as a center of debate that continues to unfold in our nation around the separation between church and state. But let's face it, this view of our Ten Commandments is too vast for us to cover today in one sermon, in one worship service, in one hour. But we know that if we focus too narrowly on the specific content of each individual commandment, we would learn a lot of interesting insights. For example, because I can't help but tell you some of these, we would learn that the original Hebrew text was written in the second person singular, where God is addressing you, 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 and you. Yet, we know that God is addressing the plural you of all of God's people in the same stroke. If we dove into the specifics of each of the commandments themselves, we would hear that Every commentator I have read on the subject is certain that when God is saying that one must honor their parents, God is not speaking to a collection of school-aged children on the steps of some chancel, but rather to adults who are charged with caring for their aging elders. But yet, if we broaden our focus and let too much in, if we take too wide a step back, 
then pretty soon we're looking at the Ten Commandments within the context of the entirety of Torah and the entirety of the Bible. And then we might find ourselves tripping over the reality that the text we just heard is only one of four different examples of the Ten Commandments in our Hebrew scriptures. And we might start to do a game where we compare and contrast to see what God really, really means in these words. I've named the temptations. They are before us as we hear this text. And candidly, I would love to lead a Bible study where we do that deeper and wider dive. But here and now, we are challenged to adjust that camera setting to focus on the text for today in and of itself so that we might hear God's word for us today. Like those Israelites who saw smoke and fire and heard trumpet blasted, blasting and insisted that God's word be mediated through Moses, we discern the right amount of light to let in so that we can be fed and led by this familiar text. Now, I know that a list of rules is not much fun to think about. It might stress us out or evoke a sense of shame when we notice the ways we might not measure up. It might back us into a corner where we think that faith is only about personal piety and righteous acts, and we start to trip over that whole dynamic of our Reformed faith of justification by faith through grace or works righteousness. Now, as many of you know, I am raising a young child, and he has said a lot this year now that he's in first grade. It was a lot easier to be in pre-K. He's right. When I asked him, well, well what was easier about pre-K, he said, I did not have to follow so many rules. And he's right. He has rules about what color shoes he wears to school and where he puts his plate when he's done eating. There are rules about how many times a day he needs to brush his teeth and the words he's allowed to say and not say, and how often he has to practice reading his red words. But I remind him over and over again, lest he get bogged down in the tedium of rule following, which really he's not going to do because he knows there's a lot more to life than rules. But I remind him that these rules are not because me or my spouse or his teachers or the world want to control him and manipulate him and force him to be a certain way in the world. Rather, these rules are to equip him, to help him make healthy choices, not only for himself, but for the world. And what's more, these rules are to try to keep him safe because he's loved and he's treasured and he's worth it. So if I were going to sum up the rules that we just read in the 20th chapter of Exodus for today in one word, I would sum it up in the word love. For the heart of the Ten Commandments is love. God gives this law to God's people, to those wandering in the desert and those gathered here in the sanctuary and those worshiping online as an instrument or a tool to direct the focus of God's people. In fact, as, as much as the text offers all of us helpful rules to live by, the gift of the law is actually not a litmus test of our faithfulness, but rather it's a mark of God's faithfulness to God's people. God gives these commandments in the middle of the desert to remind God's people that they, God's people, are God's own. They belong to God. And as their divine parent, God is giving them instructions to keep them safe, not merely as individuals, but as the people of God. God gives this law to show God's people a tangible reminder that as they wander through the wilderness, they are not alone but rather God is with them every step of the way, ensuring their safe deliverance to the promised land. God is the one who has released them from captivity. God is the one who has fed them manna and quail and water from a rock. God is the one who dwells with them even when they feel the most lost. 
God goes before them. God has their back. God accompanies them every single step of the way. But what's more, the gift of God's law is a reminder to God's people that the journey is not theirs alone. They do not travel as a group of anonymous individuals trying to make their way alone to the promised land. They are not in a race with some divinely appointed finish line, but rather they go this word together. God's gift to God's people is community in itself. Their liberation and their identity is just as much tied up in their relationship with one another as it is with their relationship with God. These commandments focus on protecting the health of the community to which end the individual plays an important role. But these 10 words to live by are not to inspire competition, individualism, or even self-righteousness. These words are about love. Author and theologian Rachel Held Evans writes this. This is the point of every liberation, every wandering through the desert, every law about oxen and yeast and blood. To love is to honor God and to keep God's commandment. Love is the law that liberates slave and slaveholder alike. Love is the ultimate deliverance story, for only love can sustain the sojourner out of Egypt, through the desert, up the mountain, and into the promised land. Now, it is not lost on me that the mission board has named today Matthew 25 Sunday. As a church, we have placed a priority alongside these commandments, a passage of scripture that is filled with an ethical mandate to love. We are charged in that parable to love the least of these, we are told, as we strive to love God. The gospel lesson that we heard for this morning takes the theology of the Ten Commandments a step forward. And it names that we, in fact, encounter God when in the people we meet, especially when our relationships draw us into care and support for those who are marginalized or wounded or outcast or oppressed. In fact, we are assured of an encounter with God directly not just when we are obedient or righteous in our acts, but when we love others, like really love them. The biblical mandate, this biblical mandate has formed our identity as a church and as a presbytery and as a denomination, just as the Ten Commandments formed the identity of God's people all those years ago. As we hold these texts alongside one another today, we are reminded once more that how we live our lives, not just as individuals, but in the quality of our community together, says more about our relationship to God and our identity as God's own than any exercise of personal piety ever would. What's more, the law and the gospel both compel us to ask, who are we? Who are we, family of God? How does God's love for us inform our relationships? Our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, our relationship to those with whom and to whom we minister outside the walls of this church. How does this mandate to love others inform our identity and how our identity is expressed in our shared call? I invite you to wonder, what is the answer that you hear if we are to ask, who are we in light of God's love? Who are we in light of God's love? Who are we in the midst of suffering? Who are we 
when forces of racism and sexism and homophobia still shape human relationship, not only in the world, but in the church at large? Who are we when we encounter hunger, whether it's hunger of our own or the hunger of one we meet? Who are we when we are at odds with another, when we find ourselves in the midst of a very real human conflict? Who are we when the landscape is dry and our spirits are dried up? Who are we when pop-up ads remind us that there's always something glitzier, better, easier, fancier to be had than that which we now possess? Who are we as we navigate transition, when we feel vulnerable or angry or unloved? Who are we when we stare hate in the eye? Who are we as the body of Christ who worships at ELPC? The texts for today remind us that these questions are not merely ours to answer in our own private prayer times, but they are to be answered and discerned in our shared communal living together. And how we answer these questions will impact the quality of our relationship with God and our shared witness to the world. But as we explore these questions together, we are reminded with humility and grace to hear the assurance embedded in our text that we never go the road alone. God is a faithful God whose love and promise and covenant precedes us, dwells within us, and nudges us forward along our way. We are God's people set free to love, held in grace, redeemed by God's own work in Christ Jesus. Friends, may we live as God's people with an awareness of who we are and who we are together. And in word and in deed, in thought, in action, in worship, and in witness, may all know God's love through our shared faith together and our engagement with the world. May they know we are Christians by our love. May it be so. Amen.